I do believe this is James' favorite book, isn't it? Romans 11, 33 through 36. This part of the chapter, he started to explain the mystery of God's salvation. And starting in verse 33, it reads, Oh, the depth and riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord, or who has been his counselor, or who has given him to gift that he might be repaid? For from him and through him and to him all things, to him be glory forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated. Well, I'm certainly happy to be with you this evening, and I'm always very grateful for the privilege that we have to come together and worship. What a wonderful opportunity it is to worship. And thank you, Nat, for the prayer. And thank you, Stan, for beautiful singing. These song leaders do such a, such a fine job, and I'm grateful for every one of them, and for the prayers and for the singing and for the scripture reading. Very grateful. Uh, one of our elders, Ed, has mentioned about our card that is prepared. And I hope you'll get several and mail them to a friend or give them to a friend and let them know about our gospel meeting. Brother Sam Wilcott is a very capable uh, gospel preacher, and I hope that you'll take the opportunity to come and be with us. You may know Sam already, as he has been here before, and I really am looking forward to our gospel meeting, and we'll talk more about that as time goes along. But please be keeping that uh, time on your calendar marked off for our gospel meeting. Try to be with us for every service. I really look forward to the opportunity of coming together and worshiping in that kind of way. A gospel meeting's almost like a homecoming where we all come back together and, and uh, we have special uh, times together and I look forward to having those times during our gospel meeting again this year. I want to speak about perhaps the most difficult subject in all the Bible. And I have to tell you in the very beginning, I'm just not capable of describing it and discussing it like it needs to be discussed and described. There's so much there that it's beyond our ability to fully comprehend and to fully study and express. In fact, a person could spend the rest of his life studying this just one subject and you never get to the bottom of it, never exhausted, because there's just so much involved in that. I wrote an article on the front page of our bulletin which reflects something of the greatness of God in just a very brief space and a brief statement as to something of the greatness of God. But I wonder sometimes how many times we really uh, think about God and how many times do we really meditate about God and think about His will for our lives and what a great being He is. One of the things that we read about from the pages of the Bible so many times is Bible writers talking about God's greatness. Well, if you'll notice on the front page of the bulletin, I gave several points there, but I want to give three points tonight. But I really felt like these are the three facts you need to know about God. If I had to boil it down to this is the absolute minimum you need to know, what would be the things that God would want you to know about Him and that you could carry away from our worship service tonight and always remember? The first fact about God is the fact that God exists. And you want to know that, that God truly does exist. And this is one of the big discussions, isn't it? That atheists have said that there is no God. But the Bible is certainly saying that there is. Can we come to know that God does exist? Well, there is elements of proving God that we want to talk about tonight, but you can't prove God from the standpoint of a of scientific empirical verification. Like you might prove that water freezes at 32 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, you can't do it that way. So if someone is trying to look at the all-powerful being, the creator of heaven and earth and the creator of our souls, by some kind of looking through a microscope or some kind of empirical verification with the five senses, then it's not going to happen that way. But all of reality is not discoverable simply by means of the five senses. There's reality out there that we have come to know that we learn in different ways. And this is certainly one of those realities. When we come to reason about him properly and we look at the logical evidence that is presented with regard to God, we can come to know 
that God does exist. I'm convinced, and this is my opinion on this point, I'm convinced that most people believe in God. Now, I don't know most people, and so I'm always very careful about making such a universal affirmative. But I think, I believe, most people believe in God. There's always been a teaching of a supernatural being as far back into antiquity as you can possibly go. There's always been the discussion with regard to the history of believing in God. If mankind is a rational being, there must be rational basis for that belief. Uh, all of history is telling us, no matter how far back the archaeological spade goes, here's a civilization that believed in God. Now their view of God may be very, very different and, and uh, false and fallacious with regard to the true triune God, but still they had a concept, some kind of concept with God. And then I think we could carry it a step further that everybody has some kind of concept about God. Now their concept about God may not be exactly right, it may not be true, it may not be accurate at all, but they have some concept. When we talk about God, people understand what we mean by that. Uh, there are some terms and some concepts out there that when we talk about them, I have no idea what you're talking about because I haven't studied the matter at all. But here's something I have a concept about, and I think everybody's that way. They have a concept of God. It may be an erroneous concept. It may not be based on factual evidence, but at the same time, they understand it. That what I'm saying is that there is rational basis here for us to consider the matter. Uh, even though uh, we go back into time, if man being a rational being as he is, there must be a rational basis for us to come to understand that God does exist. And I think this is the very first thing God wants you to know. In fact, God said, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The very first statement from our Bible is about God and what God did. And the word that's used for God there in Genesis 1 verse 1 is a very telling word. It is the Hebrew word Elohim, which is a word which means the great God of power. He is the powerful one. The all-powerful one brought the world into being. And so God certainly wants us to know this about him. If I had to figure out what facts does God want me to know the first fact would have to be about God's existence. Well, I started to talk about proving God. Is there a way by means that can be done whereby we can draw the conclusion that God does exist? And the first method that I would suggest for you, and as I go through this, it'll have to be very brief and very simple with, because of the, our, our venue tonight, because of our lesson tonight, because of the time that we have. But there is the principle of cause and effect. Science is based on it. Our culture is based on it. Our thinking, our reasoning ability is based on, on that particular matter. For every effect, there must be an appropriate or reasonable, adequate cause of that particular effect. In other words, something came into being, and we ask ourselves the question, what caused that to be? Uh, we might ask ourselves that about the universe. The universe really is a, a phenomenon in our world that we experience. What caused it to be? Maybe it's always been. Dr. Robert Jastrow was an astrophysicist, and I would read several things by Jastrow, and I always liked reading after him. He's not a Christian by any stretch, but at the same time, he was very honest in his evaluations of these scientific matters. He says, modern science denies an eternal existence to the universe. He is saying, as astrophysicist said, it's clear modern science is saying the universe has not always existed. The universe is not eternal. It had a beginning. It had a starting point. Now the question is, how did that starting point come to be? Either it created itself, or it was created by someone or something other than itself. Well, material uh, essence simply cannot create itself. A discussion along this line would naturally involve ourselves in the first law of thermodynamics. Uh, material is not being created. Matter is not being created. So in turn, those who know that much better than I, who understand that much better than I, are trying to tell us that matter could not create itself. It is not within the quality and the ability of matter to create itself. It can be destroyed. It didn't create itself. That would eliminate that possibility, and we'd have to say that someone or something created matter. And something, someone, other than matter itself, an immaterial being, 
would have to have brought it about, which of course the Bible is saying is God. Cause and effect is a powerful argument for the existence of God. We're here. What caused it? I think a very powerful aspect of proving the existence of God is looking at the design of the world in which we live. And the Bible is making very clear with regard to this principle of teleology that there's purpose to the world. You understand what the principle of purpose is all about. Take a uh, pair of pliers. Isn't that an interesting tool? You have two handles here. Now, I don't have a lot of experience with pliers. In fact, I'm not that good with pliers. But I can kind of reason about these pliers. You've got two handles here. And you know you've got those gripper things on the other end of the handles? I wonder what those are for. There must be a purpose for that. And then there's a bolt that goes through the two halves and a nut that secures them together. And by using this, I see there's design, there's purpose behind this tool. Well, the point that's being made is there are millions of examples of that in our universe and in our world. We know that the pliers did not create themselves. We know that somebody more intelligent than the pliers had that idea in mind and brought it into being that this particular tool could be used in a specific way. And we all understand something about that with regard to the human body. The human body shows tremendous design to it. Uh, it's a marvel in its amazing harmony how that it works in such a wonderful fashion together. Dr. Dr. Edwin Con Conklin is the first one that I could find, and I did some research on this. He was a former professor at Princeton University, and I was trying to find, who is it that said this? I hear preachers say these things. Well, I wonder who's the first one to say it. And as far as I can determine, this is the first one that I can find that said it, that this so-called accidental creation of life, it would be the equivalent of an explosion in a printing shop producing an unabridged dictionary. He's trying to say it's just impossible. It's not going to happen that way. I think he's right. If you look at a full unabridged dictionary that has all the words alphabetized, all the words spelled correctly, syllables laid out for us, definitions laid out for us, accents on the proper syllable, everything just exactly right, we're going to say an explosion produced that? It would be absurd. Well, here's an example of design. You know, chaos cannot bring about that kind of symmetry and design and purposefulness. So when we're looking at the universe, we find a lot of that purposefulness there. For example, the human body has something like 60 trillion cells. The human cell is an amazing thing to study. The DNA, the RNA, the, the aspects of the cell and how it functions and works and how that the cell helps with regard to the matter of carrying oxygen and how that it carries uh, proteins and things that the body needs and carries a, the waste away from the body. The human cell, but yet there are 60 trillion cells. Yet are we going to say that this precision and the skill that these cells work in harmony every single day with each other and their other elements of the body, such purposefulness and design is the result of an explosion, a big bang that happened millions of years ago? I think not. The average adult person has 206 bones. These bones serve as a structure for the body, it gives internal structure for the body, protection for the organs. The bones actually produce chemical elements for the welfare of the body. Now, if a house cannot build itself, how can a body build itself? If a house out here in the suburbs can't just all of a sudden evolve and grow and come to be, how can a physical body do that? Or there's purposefulness and design in the wonderful way that the body functions. There's the circulatory system. And you, they tell us, I don't know these matters, but people who study them do, that our bodies have 100,000 miles of pipelines. This pipeline is arteries, veins, and capillaries all working for the benefit of the human body. Think about all the water pipelines underneath the city of Tyler tonight, or maybe in your yard and the uh, sprinkler system that you have in your yard. Uh, did that just happen uh, in such an orderly fashion? Uh, for the circulatory system, and whenever the circulatory system stops, the body ceases to live. 
life goes away. It has to work. It has to work properly. It has to do that all the time. The point that we're making with regard to what God wants us to know about him is that I am fearfully and wonderfully made. And that psalm which David included that passage in is a psalm which really goes back to the kind of language which says, you know, I have this kind of system and I have that kind of system. And he's looking at this particular system. And it's almost like a, a weaver weaving different threads together into the fabric. And all of the fabric is weaved together in such a neat concentric whole. And David says, with all these different systems weaved together, I am fearfully. I am wonderfully made. There is purpose and design. And by the very existence of my own body, a fact that I cannot deny, I can come to know that God does exist. The central nervous system. What an amazing thing that is. They tell us that it sends impulses from the brain to different parts of the body at the rate of 300 miles per hour. Isn't that amazing? The brain itself. It's amazing design by God how that the brain functions and can tell the body what to do and what not to do. And a lot of it is not by a decision which we make. The brain's automatically telling the heart to beat. It's automatically telling these particular lungs to breathe in and do it in such a wonderful way. Carl Sagan was an atheist. Carl Sagan estimated that the human brain has the same equivalent information as a library has 20 million books. not that amazing? Now, who could ever say that the Library of Congress, with all the volumes in the Library of Congress, just happened to be, it just sprang up overnight? Obviously not. Richard Dawkins, a very rabid atheist in our day, and uh, he's very vocal, uh, made the statement about the design of the brain. If anyone doesn't agree that this amount of complex design cries out for an explanation, I give up. Yet Richard Dawkins has no explanation for the brain. I can tell you that right now, but he sees the design behind it. And that's the point that I think we should see so obviously from our world, the teleology, the principle of teleology, the purposefulness of the world in which we live, tells us that God does exist. But there's another matter called moral sensitivity. And I'd like to talk a little bit about moral sensitivity and what we mean by that and how that factors into this whole discussion God exists, and that's the first thing God wants me to know about Him. This moral sensitivity, there's a sense of oughtness about me, that I ought to do what's right, and I ought not to do what's wrong. And I somehow know about this sense of oughtness. When I first came across this point, I was reading C.S. Lewis in his book, Mere Christianity. And in Mere Christianity, Lewis makes the point that, um, you know, all men may not agree about what's right and wrong, but all men everywhere have a sense of right and wrong. And he uses different illustrations to illustrate the point. He said, now, everybody may not agree, you know, you line up and wait your turn. And that you break in line, and that's a bad thing. We may not all agree on the specifics of right and wrong as far as different cultures, different classes, but everybody's got a sense of right and wrong. Nobody likes a line cutter, and nobody likes cutting into the line. Nobody likes the individual who steals from the other person or takes possession from the other person. Everybody has a sense of right, and everybody has a sense of wrong. Now, where did this come from? Well, the point is, as we think about this moral sensitivity that man has, either it was given to us by God at the genesis of man, <clears throat> or it is evolvement over long periods of time when we just decide what is right and what is wrong for ourselves. If we take that view, and heaven help us if the world does, then everybody's a God unto himself. And everybody can do whatever they want to, and it just doesn't matter. You can be treated one certain way, you can treat me one way, I can treat you one way, and it just doesn't matter. Because we've all evolved through this period of time whereby we decide what's right and we decide what's wrong. And that simply is just not true. We have a sense of oughtness because we're created in the image of God. Jean-Paul Sartre, I always enjoyed reading after him. It's been a long time since I've thought about these things and read after these particular writers. But he, he was an existentialist philosopher. And in that, in France, he made this particular statement. Everything is indeed permitted if God does not exist. And I'd say amen to that. If God doesn't exist, it doesn't matter what you do. If God doesn't exist, it doesn't matter what you think. 
If God doesn't exist, it doesn't matter what happened to you. It doesn't matter if God does not exist. The fact of the matter is God does exist, and it does matter what happens to you. It does matter what you do. It matters a great deal as to how you live and how you think. And the reason it does is because God exists. And that's the first thing God wants me to know. The second thing that God wants me to know is God cares. And sometimes that's hard for us to get a handle on because we live in a world that's filled with problems and difficulties. And so many times we don't know which way to turn, we don't know what to do, we don't know what to say. But one thing is certainly clear, God cares. Sometimes we think nobody cares about me. Even the uh, psalmist uh, uh, wrote, nobody cares for my soul but me. He was so low, yet the truth of the matter is God cares. He cares for every individual. Now, I have to deal with this particular point right here in the matter of God cares, because here's the problem with regard to God caring. Why is there so much suffering in the world? If God really cares, why do we have so many problems? If God really cares, why is there such difficulty? Why is there not uh, some way out of this? We can't make any sense out of this. Therefore, we say God doesn't care. Or we say God doesn't exist. Because I can't understand it, there in turn that means God doesn't care. Or God doesn't exist. But that's not the case at all. They formulate the argument this way, and I'll try to do it in a very simple fashion. If God wishes to prevent evil, but he cannot, then he's not all powerful. If he can prevent suffering, but he will not, then he's not all good. If he has both the power and the will to eliminate suffering, then why do we have such in the world? The fallacy to that argument, which is the only real argument the atheist has, the problem of suffering. The fallacy to his reasoning here, as I've tried to present his argument to you, depending, it comes up in a little different form here, in a little different form there, but basically it all comes out to be the same thing. This is how it comes out. Either God can do it and won't, or God can't do it and wants to. If he can and he won't, why do we have it? Doesn't matter who you're reading about or studying under, somehow or another it's going to come up in that particular fashion. The fallacy is that they can't see any value or benefit to suffering. They think there's no benefit to suffering. There can't be any rationale for it. Therefore, God does not exist. Now let me at this particular point go back to our lesson text tonight, Romans chapter 11. And I didn't designed my discussion tonight to explicate that particular passage, but it is a great verse of Scripture. In verse 33, said, Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God! How unsearchable are His judgments and how unscrutable His ways! Who knows the whole mind of God? Nobody knows. Nobody could talk to God and say, God, you shouldn't have done it this way. You should have done it a better way. I don't know all the answers with regard to God and the world in which I live, but there's enough answers there to help me see that there's benefit to suffering and that God wants me to benefit from the same. When an individual comes along and he says, well, you know, suffering is bad, the first thing I say is stop right there. What do you mean bad and how did you decide it was bad? A lot of philosophers and a lot of thinkers will try to say suffering is evil. Stop right there. Don't talk to me about evil if you have no God. How did you decide what's evil? What is evil? Now, for the Christian, evil's not a problem. For the Christian, it's very clear. Sin is a transgression of the law of God. That's evil. When I, by means of free moral agency, transgress God's divine law, I'm guilty of sin. And that leads us to help in understanding the problem of suffering. This is the problem. The problem with suffering is that I have freedom of choice. God loves me. And he created me in his image. And by doing that, he gave me freedom of choice. Love allows freedom. And freedom allows choice. And now that I have this freedom of choice, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to be making some bad choices. Because I'm free to do that. 
If I make bad choices, I can suffer from that. But God loves me, and God is giving me this freedom to make a choice, and I'm glad it's that way. I don't want to be created as a robot to just do whatever I'm programmed to do. I want to be able to be free to think about it and make my choice on a free basis, and that's what God's allowing me to do. Now, if I make a bad choice, then I'm going to suffer the consequences, and suffering ensues. Guy goes out here in the Rob's Jewelry Store. Runs down the streets of uh, Tyler and the police hot on his trail. He is captured by the police, incarcerated, and turned by due process. He's brought before the uh, magistrate. The magistrate has a trial, and there the jury says he's guilty, and he goes to prison. Whose fault is that? Who brought that about? He did. He made bad choices. He was free to make those choices. He was free to make bad choices, and thus he suffered the consequences of the bad choices. We make bad choices, and we suffer because of it. Somebody else comes along and runs through a red light and hits my car. Maybe kills me or kills my loved one. I didn't do that. They did that. But you know what? I'm free. But I'm not the only free one to make a bad choice. Somebody else is out there that has freedom, and they can make bad choices as well. And I might suffer as the result of their bad choice. I can't just say freedom is for me. Freedom is for everybody. Freedom is for me and freedom is for them. And he may misuse his choice, may misuse his freedom, and I suffer as a process of that particular matter. Past generations have made bad choices and present generations suffer because of past choices that have been made. Why, there have been great benefits that have come to our day and time because of good choices that people have made in the past. Why, we have modern conveniences today because people made good choices back there, and now I'm the beneficiary of the good choices. Can I not say that also of evil choices back there in the past? Because evil choices were made, some children starved to death because their ancestors decided that they would worship cows and monkeys and rats. And for that reason, now little innocent children starve in those countries because forefathers made bad choices in those particular regards. I'm going to benefit from the good choices in the past. I'm going to suffer from the bad choices in the past that that affect me in this day and time. The fact of the matter is, there's a benefit to suffering. Not only is there, I have a point here about the natural law, but I'm going to have to spend just a brief amount of time on that. I, I think what I really want to do is go to this matter of suffering. But... What I was going to say about the natural law is the fact that gravity acts in a certain way and is very consistent. You know, I read about a building in downtown San Francisco that's actually going down into the earth, and its gravity is pulling that building down. Why, it could be that if they don't, as far as engineers are concerned, rectify the problem of the building, it could fall down and hurt somebody. But that's because gravity is acting very consistently. It's acting the way God created it to act. Where would we be if we didn't have it? We wouldn't, ha- we wouldn't have the world in which we live. We would have utter chaos and confusion. <clears throat> and we couldn't have a well-meaningful and orderly society if we didn't have principles of natural law such as that, that we can live by. But I wanted to get really to the matter of suffering and character. Because suffering really builds character. And it ought to teach us how much God really does care. If there is no suffering, then what are the traits of bravery and patience and compassion? Well, they wouldn't even exist if there weren't any suffering. You know what happens if all you have is sunshine and no rain? You get a desert. Sometimes the rain falls. Sometimes it falls in our lives. But it helps us realize God loves us and cares for us and has a better place for us. If everything were always perfect here in this life, if everything went just exactly the way I wanted it to go, why would I be concerned about going to another life? Why would I ever want to go to heaven? But it's very clear that this life, a lot of things don't go the way I want them to go. And it nudges me to go on to life on the other side. We are but strangers in this land. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 13. These all died in faith, the Hebrew writer said, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar, and having acknowledged that they were strangers 
and exiles on this earth. This world was never meant to be our permanent home. It was meant to be a place whereby we prepare ourselves for eternity. That we would grow and out of obedient faith accept the gospel of Christ and then so live our lives properly that we would go to be with God eternally in heaven forever. The purpose of suffering is to nudge us in that direction. The purpose of suffering is to help us see the value of not living life here forever, but I've got to live it acceptably before God and go on. Suffering is not against or mitigates against the goodness of God. Always remember, the Son of God suffered. In Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 8, He is the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey Him. But He learned the obedience by the things which He suffered, the Hebrew writer said. It is not mitigate against the goodness of God. This suffering was used for the benefit of man. And that's our point. It builds character. It helps us become a better person. It helps us realize that life is short and life is very uncertain and that we are not going to live here forever and ever. God cares for me and I can turn to him out of obedient faith and I can turn to him with a plaintive cry, Lord, help me, I'm suffering. And God knows. God knows. And he hears. God cares. The third thing God wants us to know about him and that is God has spoken. And if we miss this particular point, we've really missed an important point that God wants us to know about. One of the first things that comes to my mind about God and his declaration is the fact that there's this abstract means of him revealing himself. Sometimes thinkers, theologians, philosophers will call this natural theology where God, by means of the world in which we live, something that I've spent just a brief moment talking about, reveals himself. Now, the passage, as I mentioned, that always comes to mind is Psalm 19. And it's a passage that I hope you'll mark in the pages of your Bible because it does describe in a, a wonderful way this aspect about God, that he does reveal himself by the created world. He says there, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. This is going on, this revelation, this natural revelation. I just called it abstract revelation, for lack of a better term. This abstract revelation is constantly being given to us in the field of our experience. The world in which we live is telling us there is a God. He's speaking to the world that way. He's speaking through the created world, day unto day and night unto night. There is no speech, nor are there words whose voice is not heard. His point in verse 3, I'm in Psalm 19, is that it doesn't matter what speech you use, you are privy to and are aware of the great work of God in the natural uh, world, in the natural realm of things. It doesn't matter if you speak Spanish or if you speak English or if you speak German or if you speak Swahili or whatever language. This kind of speech, this kind of abstract revelation transcends all language barriers. And it doesn't matter who you are or where you are, you should be able to see from the world in which you live that God is there. Their voice goes out through all the earth, verse 4, and their words to the end of the world. Well, I'd like to continue on with this wonderful discussion in Psalm 19, but Paul brings this matter up in the New Testament as well in Romans chapter 1, and there's a wonderful discussion with regard to the existence of God and that God reveals himself through the natural world. It comes up in about verse 18. The verse that I have in mind is verse 20, but let me work into it. In Romans chapter 1 and 18, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has showed it to them, verse 20, for his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. You ought to read verse 20. Romans 1 and 20 is saying we can come to know God by the abstract revelation which we have in the world. 
The Greek word for world was cosmos. We take that word and it becomes cosmos in our language. Carl Sagan wrote a book uh, talking about the spectacular nature of our universe. Sagan was an atheist and he called it cos uh, cosmos. I wonder why he didn't call it chaos. He didn't call it chaos because there's so much order in the world and order in the universe. And just take that word universe and what it means. All the matter and energy in a whole. All of it in this world. A universe. Thereby we can look at it and study it. Astronomy. The word itself means star law. Whereby we can look at the stars and we can calculate where they're going to be at a certain time. We know years in advance if there's going to be a solar eclipse. We know years in advance if there's going to be a movement of the stars and we can track that and know it ahead of time. You know why? Because of the star law, astronomy. And if there's a law, there's got to be a lawgiver. And he's included this particular matter and we can look out into the starry night and sky and see the movements of these great stars and thus predict them with regularity because God has put them there. And what are we to say to that? It just happened that way. God is saying to us what an all-powerful God He is, that He's brought that into being, that He is the creator of heaven and earth. Look how powerful He is so that He actually controls, created and controls and maintains these matters. I copied this statement out of a uh, science magazine I was reading. The earth moves in an almost 600 million mile long orbit around the sun at a speed of 1,000 miles per minute. Now that's quite an orbit, isn't it? Those, these big numbers, they throw these around, it boggles my mind. Its track is elliptical, it says, in design. Hmm, I wonder who put that design there. He admits design, probably doesn't realize he did it. It is closer to the sun at times than it is at other times. When closer to the sun, it moves faster. When farther away, slower. As it moves in, its, in this orbit, it digresses from a slight line one-ninth of an inch every 18 miles. If the turn were only one-tenth of an inch, our planet would freeze. If an eighth of an inch, the earth would be burned to a cinder. How'd that take place? How does that happen? God is trying to say, I created this world. And he's saying it in natural means. He's saying it by means of the created world itself and how it functions. And we study it over and over again and we learn these wonderful facts about it. Here's another one that I wrote down. Maybe you can understand this. I can't understand it. By the earth I can know that the universe is estimated, I don't know how they know this, to be some 20 billion light years across. 20 billion. Now if you can understand that number, maybe you can explain it to me. Light travels at 186,000 miles per second. Now I've read also though where somebody had a real conservative estimate on that and he said it was 10 billion. This writer here said 20 billion light years across. I don't see how they would know that. I can tell by the vastness of the universe just how great the universe is, but how would you know the size of it? Because when you get into those kind of numbers, why the extremities would be unfathomable. How would you be able to fathom uh, these particular uh, numbers and the size of the universe? If it light travels 186,000 miles per second, I think that's a fact. Then 20 billion light years across, that's, that's beyond my comprehension. And what is that saying? How great God is. And he's revealing that to me. And he's telling me by means of the world in which I live, the natural order, how powerful, how intelligent, how great God is. God is there. And he has not been silent. He has spoken. And he has told us his will. That's what I call concrete revelation. Concrete revelation is more the factual data. 
Now, I could look at the world and come to understand God is there. I could look at the world and come to understand how intelligent God is and how powerful God is, but I'd never know what God wants me to do or not do <coughs> unless I have some concrete data, some concrete revelation. There's abstract revelation out there, natural theology, but there's supernatural revelation, the Word of God, the Bible. In ancient times... God used language, verbal communication, in order to talk directly to people. He spoke to Noah. He said, Noah, I'm going to destroy the world by means of a flood. I want you to build an ark. Or he talked to Abraham. He said, Abraham, I want to take your son, offer him as a sacrifice. Told Abraham what he wanted him to do. And Abraham, out of faith, was obedient. He spoke to Moses. In fact, a prophet of God, he spoke to him face to face. He committed his will in verbal language to these men. The law was given to Moses, to the Hebrew nation, back in 1500, about 1500 B.C. And um, it told what God wanted them to do and what God did not want them to do. It was the verbal language given to the people of Old Testament Israel. But then when the time was just right... Galatians chapter 4 and verse 4. God sent His Son, made in the form of man, as the perfect manifestation of Himself. John would write about it. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the, lightness, the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the doctors comprehended it not. Then he goes on to about verse 14. I'll skip on down, though I love this section of the Bible. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen His glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. What a beautiful passage that is. God revealed Himself through His Son to mankind. With all of that background, Old Testament background, New Testament background, the greatest book in all the world came to be. God revealed His will to us in what we call the Bible. It goes for some 1,600 centuries. It was written by inspired men from Moses at Mount Sinai all the way to John at Patmos. Sixty-six books are found in that biblical Treatise, all with a basic unifying theme, the glorification of God and the salvation of man. You know that in this concrete revelation, biblical revelation of God, there are 8,000 prophecies in the matter, 8,000 prophetic utterances speaking specifically about events way beyond the scope of the individual who's uttering those particular events. Sometimes they're talking about nations, Daniel chapter 2. Sometimes they're talking about rulers of nations off in the future, people they could not have possibly known, Isaiah 44, Isaiah 45. 300 of those prophecies are about Jesus, long before Jesus ever came about. Talk about the accuracy of the concrete revelation. It is unequaled. Or well, just take the book of Acts. Luke writes in the book of Acts about 32 countries. 54 cities are mentioned, nine Mediterranean islands, 95 different people. 62 of them are not mentioned by any other New Testament writer. 27 of these people are unbelievers. And he doesn't miss a step. In a world that was constantly changing and in flux, Luke's accurate accuracy with regard to these historical facts is amazing. It is the Bible. It is God's Word. I made a statement earlier in our discussion tonight. You can spend the rest of your life studying about God and never plummet the bottom of that subject. Well, I'm going to make that statement again, only this time I'm going to say you can spend the rest of your life studying the Bible and never plummet the depths of that particular subject. It deserves our careful, careful study. It diver deserves our devotion, our consideration, our meditation, our prayerful study, our honest 
consideration and fearful application with regard to our lives. If I had to know only three facts about God and only three facts, I'd want to know the fact that God does exist, and I do know that. I'd want to know the fact that God cares, and He does. And I'd want to know the fact that He has spoken, and He tells me what He wants me to do. He has told me to repent of my sins and confess my faith in Jesus Christ and be baptized into Christ for the remission of my sins. The creator of heaven and earth has said, this is what I want you to do. You know what that means? That means we better do it. And if we fail to do that, then we're going to face his wrath. And when I'm obedient to the gospel of Christ, he adds me to his church. What a wonderful discussion that is with regard to God. Next Sunday night, Lord willing, I want to talk about Jesus Christ and the things I need to know about Him. And then when I come back the next Sunday night, if I have the opportunity to do that, I want to talk about the Holy Spirit. And I want to talk about the facts that we need to know about the Holy Spirit. And then after that, I want to talk about the devil. And you don't want to miss that either. Because we're going to face Him one day, if we're not very careful. If we do not hear, so work for words, well done, thou good and faithful servant, we're going to be cast into eternal condemnation with the devil and his angels. He's a very real being. And I want to know what God wants me to know about that being as well. If you've never obeyed the gospel of Christ tonight, if you've ever, ever been obedient to the will of God, I urge you to do it now. Won't you come? While together we stand and while we sing.